Welcome back to another episode of the CSK8 podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. Each week of this podcast is either an interview with a guest or multiple guests or a solo episode where I unpack some scholarship in relation to computer science education. In this week's episode, I'm speaking with Carter Zenke, and we discuss Carter's pedagogical approach that centers playfulness, creativity, and purpose, lessons learned teaching Harvard's CS50 course to over 1 million students, balancing free exploration with learning content, designing opportunities for getting into CS, the benefits of watching recordings of your own teaching, helping educate find their why, and so much more. You can find relevant links and resources in the show notes at jaredoleary.com or by clicking the link in the app that you're listening to this on. You'll also notice in the description that this podcast is powered by BootUp, which is the nonprofit that I work for. You can check out our free curriculum and learn more about our professional development at bootuppd.org. But with all that being said, we will now begin with an introduction by Carter. Hi everyone, my name is Carter. I use he and his pronouns. I am a preceptor in computer science here at Harvard, which means that I help teach computer science 50 or CS 50 with David J. Malin here. Computer science 50, like to say, is our introduction to the intellectual enterprise of computer science and the art of programming. It's a course taught at Harvard College, graduate schools around here, as well as online. I have a few million people taking the class online. And my role is to help train our undergrad teaching staff, to design materials, curriculum, and so on. So I do things both on campus and off. Nice. A few million people taking one course. That's impressive. A few million people who've registered. <laughs> okay. We know with online courses, not all of them finish it, but we do have some pretty good retention from what I've seen. So, How do you do the grading on that though? Like, or is it just like they're able to take it, see the content, but not necessarily submit anything? Yeah. So we do auto grading for the online courses. Okay. So it's the exact same material we teach at Harvard, but the difference in grading is that college students will get sort of maybe qualitative feedback on design and style, like how well their code works, does it look pretty and is it readable? Whereas people take it online just because of the sheer number of them, they get graded for correctness. Like does their code work? Does it do what we expect it to do? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Because when we were talking before we started recording, we were talking about like the different type of grading you're doing. I was like, wow, how do you do that with that many people? Like, <laughs> You can't. <laughs> so can you tell me the story of how you got into computer science education? Yeah, I think I have to go back quite a few years. So when I was growing up, my dad worked in IT in cybersecurity and was really good at bringing me to work sometimes or to bring me home like computer parts, just like inviting me into this world of computers. And so from a really young age, I think I was lucky to get to see everything computers could do. And I got to see them in ways that they helped me do things I want to do, like express myself or like play games and like be with friends. I think I remember playing Minecraft and building my own server for friends to play with, like learning about networking through that or writing music and learning about like audio processing through that. And so I saw a lot of ways computers could be used for all these really creative purposes. And when I got to school, like particularly middle school and high school, I would take computer science classes, like quote unquote, which were really like, let's use Microsoft Publisher or let's use like Excel, which were interesting, but also didn't really match what I knew computers could do or what I wanted them to do. Right. So when I went to college, I had this in my mind of like, I really wanted to dive into computer science. And I did. And even there, I saw some classes I liked, like I took computer science 201 at Duke with Owen Astrakhan. That was a great class. And I took some that I didn't like that were more on the theory side of things. And I realized that I wanted to do something that would help more people see what computer science could be. And I got involved with a few education communities on campus, a few classes really that showed me maybe my role is less to work in computer science and more to like help other people hopefully see what computer science can be. So how have you done that since then? So I think a lot of that has been trying to think of when I was an undergraduate, what I was an undergraduate. And a lot of what that looks like was getting involved with research or designing curriculum and going to informal learning spaces and teaching it. So we formed a lot of partnerships with elementary schools around where Duke is located. And I got to really work with teachers there and learn from them about what works in their classroom, what doesn't, and also how can we bring computer science into classrooms? And so I got to build some relationships there as undergraduate. And afterwards, I went on a path of wanting to be a teacher and did my master's in education at Harvard, and then later on just took this job teaching CS50. So your approach to CS education is very different than what tends to occur in like the K-12 space, like in any kind of subject area. So when I was looking at your website, you kind of forefront playfulness, creativity, and purposeful. Yeah. I'm curious, like for you, what do each of those mean to you? And then I got some follow-up questions about them. Sure. I think at the time that I was making that website, I was reading a lot of Mitch Resnick's work and he has, you know, the project passion, peers in play. Yep. That really resonated with me. And I was thinking about that in the context of my own experience with computer science when I was younger. And I think I particularly resonated with the idea of like playfulness. And when I was working with computers really when I was younger, I didn't have like a problem I was trying to solve. I was just 
using them to build something, like to make something happen, whether it was music or a server for friends to play on. And that for me, it sort of exemplifies what it might mean for things to be playful and creative, like just tinkering on things and trying to make something actual, like for people to play with too. And then purposefulness came in, I think, particularly as I got more involved with education communities, I think, and thinking about the ways that, well, one, education sort of reflects the inequities in society and injustices there. And so one, like, how can we show people computer science can be used to help address things and to take action and really make things better in the world? And more recently, even thinking about people who are in different disciplines and maybe won't do computer science, how can we show them that computer science has purpose in their own discipline too? So a few things in purposeful, but playfulness and creativity mostly came from Mitch Resnick, honestly, and thinking about my own experiences too. Yeah. And if anyone hasn't listened to the interview that I did with him, I'll include a link to it in the show notes. But yeah, that definitely makes a lot of sense. Like I was in a session with Mitch yesterday where he was talking about things. And so like, just like hearing him talk about it yesterday and then hearing you talk about it now, I'm like, okay, yeah, I can, I can see that alignment. Yeah. You've had a variety of experiences, both as a student, both as an educator, like in formalized, informal, and kind of like a mix between the two in terms of spaces. I'm curious that this is a broad question. Like if you're to design an ideal learning environment, and that can be anywhere, like what would you do to center those three words within that space? I think I have seen, and I've heard a lot about this idea of a studio, and I love the idea of a studio. And for me, I think a studio is a place where people can be united under one kind of common purpose for their learning that's kind of purposefully vague but they get to bring their own experiences and own kind of flavors to what it means to approach that mission and they tinker on their own things they talk to each other they build community together and i think we often associate studios with spaces so like for example here on campus we have a brand new building for computer science and has a lot of quote-unquote studios there where we have tables and chairs and like state-of-the-art tech and everything and that's nice as a studio but i've also seen like teachers in dc public schools who are teaching computer science and are using their classroom as a studio where people can come in during lunch, after class, before class, and just work on things together. So I love that idea. How does that compare or contrast with makerspaces? I think it's pretty similar. From what I've seen in makerspaces, like I think, yeah, very similar ideas there. Cool. Yeah, because when you're describing it, it just kind of reminded me of it. But like with a makerspace, like there's so many different variants or flavors of it that it's like when somebody says it, it's like, well, let's see what it looks like. And how does that compare to some other ones? Like the makerspace that was in my school was different than in other schools. Yeah. I like the idea that there's like a lot of diversity in makerspaces and a lot of diversity in what studio can be. And you can really tailor it to people who are actually showing up there and doing what they want to do. Yeah. I think that is extremely important, but is often not found in formalized spaces. Like whether it's K-12 or in higher education classes that I've worked in or with or been a part of, like most of them, it's like, we're all going to create the same thing and have the same outcomes as everybody else, even though we all have different interests, needs, desires, et cetera. Yeah. So teaching CS50 this spring, we have a little bit of that, which is that the course is divided into different problem sets where everyone's going to make the same problem set, essentially, going to solve the same problems. We try to have some differentiation there. We have problems for people who are more comfortable and people who are less comfortable. And so I'm going to give them like some differentiation there. But I think one thing that I want to think about is how we can provide more diversity in our problem sets for students in a given week. So they're not all working on the same thing at once. Yeah, that's hard though, at the scale that you're at. Let's say, let's cut it down a bit. So even if you had 100,000 students that you're working with, like to be able to come up with something that is going to be auto graded, that students can also create something that's meaningful to them. I don't know, that's, that's hard. It is. And at a certain level, I think we also want to make sure people get through a certain amount of content. Right. And I love the idea of the studio and the makerspace. And I think they can be designed in a way that we make sure people get through a certain set of content. But it's really interesting to me that at the scale, like you were saying, and, and so on, it's like, well, we got to make a few trade-offs in some cases. So Yeah, especially for like a degree, like where you have X number of credits that you have to earn and usually within a given number of years or semesters or time, like there's a lot of constraints that kind of impact what might be the ideal environment versus what you can actually do. Yeah, totally. What caused those concepts, the playful, creative, and purposeful to resonate with you? I think a lot of it just went back to my own first experiences with CS. I don't think at the time when I was, you know, a kid playing on computers that I was like, oh, I'm doing this because it is purposeful and playful and creative. But I think later on, as I've gotten to see some of the frameworks in CS education, like Mitch Resnick's or like other ones too, I think I've seen those like really show up in my own experiences. It's been like this weird affirmation of 
wow, I can see myself in some of these theories that I've learned about as I've gone into education. Right. Why do you think more educators don't actually engage in these concepts or like Mitch's? And I think to some extent, it's about their own context. And so in some cases in CS50, I don't think we're foregrounding like creativity and playfulness. I think in some cases we're trying to foreground a learning experience that is still really good, but that is pretty focused on content. Right. And so for example, a new Python course, a course on programming language in Python. And so what we'll do is we'll design some very short exercises for students to do. And a lot of the course is going to a lecture that's pre-recorded and then doing some exercises later on. And I think that's great for the kind of context in which an online learner is maybe doing things, but it feels a little tougher to make a studio in an online classroom. So I think context kind of matters a lot for those things. Yeah. That balance between the freedom to explore and to express and create, and then the need or desire to learn content is sometimes difficult when even they're interconnected or separate into like, hey, we're going to have like a couple of classes that are very content focused and then we'll lead to like an open-ended studio where you create whatever you want. But yeah, I don't know. Just kind of me thinking out loud. I don't think we would still be talking about creativity and playfulness if they didn't help people learn. I think they do. Like they're great for content. Right. But I think there are certain contexts like the online one in which you're trying to serve hundreds of thousands of learners. And it is sometimes maybe easier and maybe better to have something that's a little more on a track of content. Yeah, so let's double click on that to just kind of highlight it a bit. One of the things I like to do is think of something that I'm like very passionate about and strongly agree with, but think of when I would not do that thing in education, like a pedagogical approach or whatever. So for like these three concepts, when would you not use them or focus on them? I mean, I don't want to sort of repeat the same content answer, but I'm trying to think of like what seems to be unique in the online context that makes me feel like those things are less possible there. And I wonder if it's because people are coming into CS50, for example, online, and they're often individuals and they're taking the class on their own. There are also people, if I, you can follow my train of thought here, also people who are taking CS50 who are building their own community while they're doing it. And they're like taking it in their own local group of people who are doing the class. And that I feel like there is some space for those things to happen. But for people who are taking the class online, just looking at the website, just doing the problem sets, it feels like those things are harder to do. And I honestly don't even know if what we would do to emphasize those in some cases. That's like a question I would have. Yeah. So some of the programming languages that I've learned, I've learned informally by just like watching a lot of videos on YouTube to see other people talking through using X language in whatever IDE. And it has been useful for me to get the content, but ultimately I was learning that content so I could do something to express myself and be creative down the road. But in that process, it was just more of one direction I was consuming information. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's like a time and a place for that. Right. And I think there are some different principles that might really make that kind of more unidirectional content delivery really like better and worthwhile as a learning experience. And I know CS50 in particular places a lot of value on the production quality of lectures. Um, when I first joined the team here, I learned we had four or five full-time staff whose job it is to record lectures, to edit them, to make them like beautiful when they're an end result. And so that was a new way for me to think about what it means to deliver content and make that a compelling experience for people. Yeah, that's cool. That's high production. Here I am editing all of my videos by myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, how do you design experiences or opportunities for people to get into computer science or computer science education? One thing that's been new to me since I joined the CS50 team has been kind of the importance of these metaphors that we have. So in the very first lecture, for people who have not seen it, spoiler is that David takes a phone book and tears it in half and tears it in half again in order to kind of illustrate binary search, like trying to find somebody in a phone book, you just tear it in half and in half again. And it's a very kind of dramatic example because he's on stage, like literally just ripping this huge phone book in half. But it's also kind of this thing that people are a little familiar with, at least hopefully if they've like seen a phone book before. And later on to teach kind of search, we'll do looking behind maybe eight closed doors or eight lockers and literally manually opening them one by one by one. So trying to sort of showcase these metaphors that are grounded in something concrete and that also illustrate something really powerful about computer science and what it can help you do. And I've noticed that's been pretty useful in this content delivery kind of teaching style. There's a book I haven't read yet, but I've heard recommended. I think it's called Metaphors We Live By. Have you heard of that? I think I've heard of that one. Okay. I don't know if that informed like the design of using metaphors and whatnot or not, but I haven't read it. So maybe I should. <laughs> <laughs> no, and to be honest, I'm not sure. I, I'm also pretty new to things. And so I'm also learning as I go. Yeah. Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs>
aren't we all? <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I ever feel like I've gotten to a point where I don't need to learn more, then I should probably leave the field because it's just, there's so much to learn. I'd agree with that. Yeah. When we spoke before today's conversation, you talked about how you helped undergrads find their why in education. So I'm curious, could you expand upon that? Sure. So in my on-campus role where I'm leading this course, a lot of what I do is help our 80 undergraduate staff and some graduates to teach you 50 well. How can they be good teachers? And part of what I think goes into that job is helping them find out why they're there teaching CS50. I think when they first join, they do it because they want to be with their peers. They want to just try it out. Like they have a lot of variety of reasons for being there. And my goal is hopefully that each one of them takes something away from have that teaching experience and says, I could do something in education later, whether I'm going to be a full-time teacher, whether I'm going to like help people on the side, like I could do something there. And I think to do that, we focus a lot on community building. So just bringing everyone together, doing activities. We had our spring kickoff recently where we talked about basically why we're there and, and what fears we have, what excitements we have and things like that. So trying to sort of embed that in a great community of undergraduate staff, and then also trying to find time to meet with them individually and talk about why are you here? What do you want to get out of being on staff? Yeah, it was interesting when you mentioned like find a way to teach it part-time or something. That is an interesting challenge for CS education because in this field, you could make double, triple, quadruple the amount than you would as an educator. If you were to just go and apply what you know in computer science and industry. So my degree is in music education. It's like the opposite. Like it's most musicians that are great musicians aren't going to be able to sustain themselves just making music. So education is like the way to make monies. It's weird having my feet in both worlds and see like how different that is in terms of incentives for being or not being an educator. Yeah. Recently, I've been getting to watch some like industry talks by people who are in the computer science industry and are sharing technologies they've built or things they've learned. And I'm like, you're teaching right now. You're working at a company. You're not full-time teaching, but you are sharing a technology with somebody else. You are in some ways, if you were to gear this towards newcomers, like helping them into the field in some ways. My goal is not for everyone on the staff to not go into tech industry, but I think if they were to do so to consider what they could do while they're there to invite more people into it through teaching in some way. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Like you could teach by creating a YouTube channel. Like there's a guy that I watch, his YouTube channel is called The New Boston. And he's got a bunch of playlists on like how to use whatever language and whatever IDE. And it was great for like refreshing on, well, C++, like what's the syntax for that? Or like, oh, I wanna learn Swift. Let me watch those tutorials, et cetera. But then like even this podcast is a way to also help be in education without necessarily being in education. Like there's many different ways that you can do that. Yeah, totally. I would certainly hope that some of them go on to really consider teaching as a full-time profession and really like spend more of their time on that. But I also right. recognize there's a lot of ways to do it and I'd love to help them do any of those. How has your experiences working in like informal learning informed your approach for formalized learning? I was thinking about this and I think going back to CS50's dichotomy between being an on-campus course and kind of this online course, mm -hmm. I've noticed that it's often the people who are taking the course online informally who catch the things that I would not have caught in, in problem sets or in the code we write to help check problems. We get emails from a lot of people who are saying, well, did you consider this about this problem set? Or I tried it this way. And I don't know if y'all considered that I would do it that way. And you're like, you're right. We didn't consider that. And so it's interesting for me because I feel like I learn a lot from the people who are doing the class, not at Harvard and students who are taking the class just online informally. Is that just because it's a larger sample size, so more eyes on it and they're able to give more feedback? I think, yes. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a function of sample size. One thing I wonder about too is whether I think people take the class in just such different contexts. I think we have people who are taking it at like 3 a.m. in the morning in their like house in another country. And there's no possible way for us to know every single person who's going to take to class or engage with the problem sets. And when they do, it's like, oh, it's always surprising. I worked in a district where previously every year it was the same lesson, the same curriculum. You just pulled out your lesson. Okay, what am I teaching on this day? And the district gave it to you. And it very rarely changed. However, when I went and did my residency, I interned, or did a teaching assistantship with a professor multiple semesters in a row. And it was fascinating to see how he changed it to meet the, like, what are we learning now? What's more relevant today, et cetera. And so I took that idea. And when I went back into the classroom, into a K-8 school, 
or just constantly changing stuff. Every week was something different. It was very different. So I'm curious for you, how do you iterate on your curricula or coursework? We're constantly doing that. We'll even change things partly through the semester if we need to. Part of it starts with just getting good data. And for us, we're actually kind of lucky because we have a pretty big sample size of students who can give us feedback. So with that, we get a lot of input on what worked well, what didn't work well. And at least for the on-campus course, which is still quite large, about 700 students, we ask them after every problem set, what did you learn? And like ask them to reflect on that. And we can kind of, by looking through that, figure out, okay, here's what they actually learned. Here's what we thought they would learn and see differences between those things. Mm. And then with that data, we will go off usually in the summer and try to make some pretty big changes, either to problem sets or to the structure of the course. And we'll all come together as a staff to talk about those. And then even during the fall, when it comes up, we will in a given week sort of treat it like this unfurling of the semester where we can go ahead and just change things a week before we're going to introduce them in some cases. Are there archives of prior classes available? Yeah. So we keep all of the course materials kind of in their own website and a different URL will take you to those past classes. So if you do 2021 slash fall, you'll see 2021 fall, or if you do 2020 slash fall, you'll see 2020. So you can see the past iterations. And what I've learned is we've even had a, a whole CDN that is full of past materials and past resources from 2008 onwards. Like the course has a history to it that I've only been here for one year of, but it's really interesting to see how everything's changed over time. That would be interesting to study or even to have like anyone involved with the iterations kind of narrate over like, here's what we changed and why we decided to do that. Like being a curriculum nerd, that would be fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I think there might be some videos up there of David and my colleague Doug who was in this role before I was and they were talking together about just why they made some changes one year which is fascinating. And I think I watched a few of them. I should watch more of them too, but they're out there if you're interested. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. I'm curious if we were to zoom in on yourself, how do you iterate on your own abilities, whether it's like as an educator or just in computer science? One thing I've been trying to get the nerve to do is to watch my teaching recorded. So my classes are recorded for people who can't come on a given day and need to watch it later, which is great. And it's also a great feedback tool it's also painful to watch yourself in some ways. <laughs> it's really useful. Like I know after we'll give a, a lecture, which David does, we'll debrief afterwards. And then in the coming year, we'll watch those lectures again and talk about what we want to do differently in the fall. So it's very helpful. And for me, I'm trying to do it just on my own. It's like, oh, it's sometimes painful, but also useful. Hmm. Where are the pain points, if you don't mind me asking? I think I get a little bit of like a secondhand embarrassment, like just seeing myself <laughs> teaching in some ways. I think part of that is just psychological and nothing's like, yeah, just anyone I think would feel that way. At least I hope so. Yes. <laughs> and I think other parts of it is like looking at it and being both critical and kind of optimistic for the future. Like, oh, I could have done that better. And I think I will do it better next time by planning ahead for that. You know? Yeah, I've engaged in recording practices since I started teaching and this was like before I even finished my undergrad like I would record myself like working with drum lines and like watch it and whatnot and when I was a university supervisor would see like pre-service and in-service educators like go over the recordings with him and like walk through like hey what did you think of this etc and hands down like almost everybody is like they feel uncomfortable watching themselves doing that so that's not unique to you so it's very weird watching yourself but it's so informative like I have done it so many times now that I actually feel comfortable doing it. And this is like coming from somebody who is like an introvert who like would have a panic attack, like initially like watching that kind of stuff. Cause it's like, oh, I could have said this differently or I could have done this differently, but oh, totally. you learn so much from the process and just thinking of like, subtle ways to refine things and whatnot. And it was really informative for when I was teaching the same content or lesson to multiple different classes. And I can iterate on each one of those and like try something different for each one of the classes and then go back and watch each one of the recordings to figure out, okay, which one worked really well, which one did not. So like kind of having that A-B test with the classes that I was working with was really helpful for myself. Yeah, I got to do something like that this semester where I taught a class on Tuesday afternoons and the same class then the following morning on Wednesday. And only the Tuesday one was recorded, but it was a very different kind of classroom environment between like Tuesday at 3 p.m. and Wednesday at 9 a.m. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I would have loved to have a recording of the Wednesday class because I feel like it would have been really fascinating to see the differences there. Yeah, well, and having the different classes at different times and teaching the same content is also helpful for realizing 
when some things are out of your control. Cause like I would sometimes have like three third grade classes come in back to back and each class would be drastically different. And it might be because of their homeroom teacher is like really awesome at what they do. Or maybe their homeroom teacher like gave this entire class like a bunch of cake or something before they came into your room. And then like they'd just be bouncing off the walls. So it was like good to have that, like to realize, oh, not everything that goes wrong is my fault. <laughs> sure, no, that's a really good point. Yeah, we want to keep in mind. What has surprised you about your work? And when I say work, like think broadly, it doesn't necessarily have to be with this particular course, but just like overall. I think I'm surprised by this most times, which is people with sort of inherent curiosity and wanting to learn and the extent to which they'll go to learn. For example, when I was in more of an informal space, like working with educators and seeing the ways that the students would ask questions and really just be constantly curious was always really surprising in a good way to me. And now recently working with this course that is both in person and online, seeing people who show up to our Zooms at, again, like 3 a.m. in the morning to be with CS50 and like to learn content that's freely available. Like that is surprising to me in like a really hopeful way. So I've been, I think it inspires me to like try to live up more to their expectations and to, to do better for those students who are doing that. Yeah, that's great. It's nice to have happy and pleasant surprises like that. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Curiosity is something that I wish we focused on more or assessed more in the classroom. It's one of those things that like inquiry-based learning is like, yeah, this is great, but like, do we actually assess whether or not students are curious in the classroom? And I'd argue that we kind of, as a field, tend to pay lip service to it at times, but don't necessarily follow up and say, this is important and here's why, and really strongly encourage it. Yeah, I don't know. I one question I would have is how would we define curiosity and would it look different for different fields, different classrooms? Mm -hmm. For us, we've been thinking about as we do like assessment, how do we define, for example, like good design for code? Like what does that look like? And that's a, a challenge. Yep. And similarly for curiosity, I wonder what that would look like. Yeah. I mean, the different types of projects that you could create or the different concepts that you can bring into your projects like there's many different ways that you could explore it and then depending on the context like there's many different foci that you could engage in yeah we've offered different versions of problem sets like for people who are less comfortable and more comfortable i wonder if something is like well does the student at least maybe try the more comfortable problem set but i feel like there are other things that are involved in that like audacity in some ways or uh, self-confidence and so i feel like there are ways to do it i don't have enough experience yet to really know what to look for as much. Hmm. That's interesting you say that. Don't have enough experience yet. And yet, like in one semester, you are directly or even indirectly working with more students than most educators will see in a lifetime. <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit of a scary thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> didn't mean to <laughs> emphasize that pressure. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no. So I guess speaking of the pressures, like there's a lot of pressures working in the field of education or as an educator. How do you stave off the burnout that can come with it or work through those pressures? I think there's always like a new project to tackle. With any course, I think there's something you can always do to improve it. And talking with educators, I always know that they're, I want to do this, I want to do that. And I think that's an amazing attitude to have. And I think it's one that sustains people. I've also tried to learn to say no to some things and try to focus some stuff. I'm not going to make that improvement this fall. I'm not going to do this or that. And I'm instead going to focus on this other thing because it'll more aligns with these values I want the course to have in this case. And that's both freed up some time for me. And I think also allowed me to focus more and make something better when I decide to make a change. Do you have any recommendations for improving equity and inclusion in CS education? Yeah. So one thing that we've been doing here on campus is just connecting with groups who are already doing this work. And I think if I were to offer any advice or any encouragement, you just connect people who are already doing this and who have been advocating for this for a really long time. And so concretely on campus, this means connecting with like women in computer science groups or groups that have been fighting for representation in computer science and doing more joint events, listening and, and like making decisions for the course based off of their advocacy. And so I think more so just listening and taking action based off of that. I like that. What do you wish there was more research on that could inform your practices or what you do in CS education? Going back to helping educators find their why, like a lot of this job is really working with a whole bunch of future teachers or people who are just getting started in teaching. And so I'd love to learn more about how we train and support new teachers in computer science, particularly, especially people who are themselves currently students too. So it's like a weird thing for people who I'm working with because they're students and they're also teaching and they're brand new to everything. That's like a great place to be in as a person. And I would love to learn more about how to support people who are in that role. And it's like been right now it's trial and, and learning as we go. Yeah, it was like a month or two ago 
was working with the Maryland Center for Computing, and they did like a little in-service on pre-service education and like what higher ed faculty members can do to try and support CS education within that. It is like... Basically, what computer science was maybe 10 years ago in K-12 space is like now finally getting into the pre-service education where it's like, hey, we need to do this thing. We need to do it like right now. So yeah, in the next decade or so, I expect this to be much more common practice and much more research to come out on that particular topic. That would be a godsend for me. Um, I would love that. Stay tuned. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And even I think I would love to in some ways contribute to that. I would love to do more research in this role if I had more time. And so I think if there's a way for me to help contribute to that, I would love to be able to do that. What's something that you're working on that you need help with that a listener might be able to help with? Concretely, uh, like TA training programs. I know that they exist at a variety of universities and I got to attend SIGC this year, which is really exciting for my first SIGC. And I got to meet people who were designing TA tuning programs there. And that was a super fascinating topic. And I just love to learn more about those, see more examples, and grab some takeaways and then apply them here. Do you listen to the CS Ed podcast? KSM, Christian Seamus Martinez. Mm-hmm. I have heard of it. I need to listen to it more. All right. So the most recent episode, at least at the time of recording for the CS Ed podcast, is titled How to Build a TA Program. And so they talk about that in that particular episode. So I'd recommend checking that out. That might point to some more resources. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Dr. Shemus Martinez. (laughs) (laughs) And I I did an interview with her. It was awesome. So I'll include a link to that in the show notes if people haven't listened to it. Do you have any questions for myself or for the field? A question that was posed to me recently that I've been thinking about is what is the difference between a really good teacher and a great teacher. And I think we all want to be great teachers. And I'm sure there's like a lot that goes into that. And especially as I've been thinking about trying to iterate on my own teaching and better serve, you know, beginning teachers, I'm trying to figure out an answer to that question that maybe highlights things I should focus on as an educator too. Yeah, that is a really good question. I think the reviewing your own videos will really help you figure out long term the difference between that is like one of the things that you could do is even reverse engineer somebody that you feel is a phenomenal teacher and then try and compare that with your own videos and go what did they do that I love and that I want to emulate or what's something that they do that I don't want to emulate that I think I do really well and want to emphasize some more because like sometimes it's not just learning what to do in education but also learning what not to do and like figuring out that balance absolutely and I've talked to some educators who when I asked them, how did you get to do what you do? Like, how did you basically build yourself to what you're doing today? And they were like, I just more so thought what not to do and tried to avoid that, which is a really interesting response to me. Yeah, I've had some phenomenal educators in my life and some ones that were so bad that I want to make sure I'm not anywhere near <laughs> approaching education the way that they were, because I definitely learned what not to do in those scenarios. <laughs> Yeah, totally. So then the last question that I have is where might people go to connect with you and the organizations that you work with? Yeah, the canonical URL is cs50.harvard.edu. I am not on Twitter, but you can follow at CS50 if you are interested in CS50 particularly. And with that, that concludes this week's episode of the CSK8 podcast. I really hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did, and I hope you consider checking out Harvard's CS50 course using the link in the show notes at jaredoleary.com. If you'd be so kind, please consider sharing this episode with somebody else or sharing your review on whatever platform that you're listening to this on. It just helps more people find it. Stay tuned next week for another episode, and until then, I hope you're staying safe and are having a wonderful week.